When I was in elementary school, where I grew up, uh, up in the Midwest, uh, the school I went to, the playground was essentially uh, an asphalt parking lot. Okay, no grass, uh, not a, not a blade of green grass anywhere to be seen. Uh, you know, hard, rough. Like if you're at, out at recess, running around, and somebody throws a football and you dive for it, you're gonna get all, you're gonna skin up your knees. You know, no soft squishy, artificial turf like we have here, right? And then in the winter, when it snowed a lot, so I don't know if some of you have to use your imagination, right? Like it's snow and it's coming down and it's piling up. What would happen is snow plows would come and they would, they would push all this snow off to the side and, and you'd have these big piles of snow. And as you can imagine then, that, that made for kind of an epic time at recess, right? We all, we'd all put on our snow pants, big puffy coats, and we'd go outside, and we would climb up on these big piles of snow. And there was a game that we would sometimes play, a game called King of the Hill, or as some of us called it, King of the Mountain, right? And it was really fun if you were kind of a bigger kid, right, stronger kid, one of the older kids at recess. The object of the game was to climb to the top and to stay on the top, and you could push down, throw down anybody else. So the big Older kids, the stronger kids, they love this game. The smaller, younger kids, they get thrown down at the bottom. So the object is like, who's going to be on the king? Who's going to be the king of the hill? Right? And as you can imagine, things could get pretty ugly pretty fast. I, I mean, I remember at least one, one of my classmates broke his arm playing king of the hill. I remember kids like smashing their heads on the frozen asphalt. And then like, as you can see, that pile of snow pretty quickly gets all packed down. And after a day or two, it turns into like this big iceberg, sharp and hard. Like this just, I mean, this is like the late 80s, early 90s, okay? So like, you know, suck it up was kind of the mentality. <laughs> and I didn't even know the word concussion at the time. I never heard that word before. Well, I'm pretty sure I had at least one of those concussions Trying to play king of the hill. Not good, right? Not good. And of course, we're never going to have to worry about that, ever seeing that or doing that here in, in Doral, Florida, right? That's probably a good thing. And yet at the same time, friends, even as adults, we are still very much in danger of playing the, the very same kind of game that, wherever we go in life. And if we're not careful, as we're going to see today, this game, this game, King of the Hill, can be really quite dangerous. Because remember what we've been talking about in our series so far, right? We're in a battle for our hearts. Right? We're in a battle for our hearts. And, and we, we saw last week that the God, the true God, he's jealous for our whole heart, your whole heart. Because he's the only one who's truly committed to you and loves you and can actually help and save you. Idols, right? False gods, the things that call out for us to worship them, they don't have the power. They don't have the ability. They cannot come through on any of their false promises to actually help us or to make us truly happy. Right? Friends, we were made to worship God, but... All these other things that call out for our hearts can pull us away from God. So today, we're going to be talking about how we live in a world uh, where there's so much pressure to kind of like be king of the hill. You know what I mean? Right? To climb to the top, to be on top of the world, to be successful. Right? To get what you've worked hard for, to, to be the highest paid. To get whatever title or pay grade or, or whatever position will give you that sense of being in control of your destiny. Or maybe even what you think that you deserve. So again, friends, we, we're made to worship God, but we can end up sacrificing so many things to, to worship at the, at the altar of power. That it ends up destroying our relationship with God. The one person whose relationship we really need. Okay, so we're going to look at God's word today, uh, a really powerful and a very practical story that's going to help us uh, just to see how God's word has the power and how God wants to help us um, break that, that hole so that we don't, we don't have to you know, 
have this pressure of being king of the hill. Because God's given us something so much better. So we're going to read today from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, 10 verses. Here's, here's the story. It says at verse 17, Mark chapter 10, if you're following along uh, with, the, with your Bible, or on your Bible app, or at home. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Okay, like, hint, hint. <laughs> if you want to talk about good in the sense of, like, perfect good, do you understand who you're talking to? I'm not just a not just good teacher, but God alone, God alone. So Jesus already is like going for his heart right here. So here's what Jesus says. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Oh, teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Oh, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad. Because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, well, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. All right, so here we meet somebody. He's described in the, the text as a, a rich young man, right? Who, who perhaps... Thought he had it all. Or maybe when other people looked at him, they thought to themselves, well, here's a guy who's made it. Here's a guy who's got it all. Like, he'd done well for himself. He had some successful business uh, ventures. He had become wealthy. He seems very confident in his own abilities. Like, he's on top of the world. And yet, and yet he walks away from Jesus. Sad. I mean, think about that. Can you imagine, like, having this conversation, can you imagine meeting Jesus, and he takes the time, and he has a conversation with you. He's, he's gonna, you're asking him a question, whatever it is. He looks at you, he talks to you, he loves you, and you walk away from Jesus? Friends, you see, this, this is the pull and the power of idolatry. Like I said last week, idols don't have any power in of themselves to, to help us, to save us, to do anything for us. But idolatry, right, the pull of worshiping false gods has the ability to destroy your relationship with God and ultimately leave you feeling empty. I mean, the, the conversation started out well enough, though, right? I mean, the rich young man, he was going to Jesus looking for an answer to a very important spiritual question. All right, so I mean, let's at least give him some credit for that, right? In a world where so many people are just like, are just running around, racing around, doing stuff, not even thinking about really deep spiritual things and how important that might actually be, much less going to Jesus for their answers, right? So, I mean, give him some credit for that. It tells us, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, like, that's kind of the biggest question there is, isn't there? 
right? So like here we got this, this, this rich young man who seems like he's, he's got it all in life. Like from a worldly point of view, he's king of the hill. He's made it, right? But, but despite all this, there's still this like, like gnawing, gnawing in his soul. Despite all of his worldly success, there's still, he's like he's still got this feeling that it's something, it's like the, the deepest longing of his heart isn't yet satisfied. Right? You know anybody like that? They got, a, they got a successful company or career. Nice clothes, a nice car, a nice house, the latest technology. Right? They, they got it all. But they're not really yet still happy. Or they got it all, but they're always worried about losing their stuff. So they keep working and working and working to get more stuff, even though they're sacrificing so many other important things. So they think, oh, I'll have time for that later. But then they don't. I think that's the same kind of thing maybe going on with this rich young man. And, and it sounds to me that even though he's successful and he's got all this stuff, maybe he's thinking like, you know, well, despite all that, one day I'm going to die. And then what? What about my sins? Can I really dare to think that I could stand before God on the day of judgment boasting about how much I love other people? Even as much as I've loved myself, that's how I've loved everybody else all the time, from the heart. Can I, can I really dare to stand before the all-knowing God and boast about how in my life I always put him first all the time. I never skipped church to go do something else. I always put Bible study, prayer, helping the poor, giving. To, I, I did all that for you, God, all the time. Can I really? Can you, can you really think that? Could he dare to even hope to go to heaven? Again, like, at least he's thinking about spiritual things. He's further along than a lot of people are in our world today. But friends, how about, how about you? What is, what is your top priority in life? Like, what's the most important goal that you have in your life? How many of you, it, without, without blinking, if I ask you, what's your top priority in life? How many of you would say, my top priority in life right now is preparing for eternity? And along the way, helping to prepare as many people as I can for eternity. You see, this is, this is one, uh, one way that playing the game, King of the Hill, you know, the world's game, that makes it so dangerous. Because our, our drive to excel, our desire to achieve, to, to get, to earn, to be successful can make us forget that eternity is a really long time. Whether an eternity in heaven with the Lord, right, or an eternity in hell, apart from God. Eternity is a really long time. Our, our earthly success, our money and our toys, like being on top of the hill, on top of the mountain, that's, that's all temporary. And, and yeah, while, while many of these things can be considered blessings, right, blessings of God, even... Even blessings that God gives as a result of, of faithfully using our gifts and abilities and opportunities that he gives us, we are in a daily battle not to let any good thing, any even blessing of God become something that takes the place of God on the throne of our hearts. And because he loved him, that's what Jesus needed the rich young man to see. My friends, because he loves you and me. That's what Jesus wants us to see in our lives, too. Do you remember how Jesus answered the young man's question? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, perhaps surprisingly, you know, like, what did Jesus, he, he said, well, obey the Ten Commandments. And he checked off a few of them, right? Like, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, honor your father and mother, like, Go down the list. You know these things, right? And do you remember the rich man's reply? Here it is one more time. In verse 20, he says, Teacher, all these I've kept since I was a boy. I mean, come on. I mean, really, dude? 
I mean, you middle schoolers here, like, would you, would you have the audacity to say that to Jesus, the Son of God? Like, I've never seen, I've been perfect. All the time. I honor my parents, I obey my teachers, I do what's right. And not just because I want to get something out of it from somebody, because it's the right thing to do to honor God. I mean, like, come on, man. Oh, these are kids. Like, can you really, you really think you can stand before God and, and boast about, like, how you never once lost your temper or said something cruel or mean to somebody just because it, like, felt good? And you were in a position where maybe you had the influence to actually, like, you know, hurt somebody because of it? I mean, dude, can you really think like you can stand before God to boast that, that you've never looked at a woman lustfully or, or flirted with somebody who's not your spouse? I mean, come on, man. Can you really think you stand before God and, and they say, yeah, I never, I never shaded the, the truth of a matter so as to make myself look better than somebody else, right? We call that lying. You know? I mean, can anybody really think they can stand before God and say, God, I've kept all the commandments in thought, in word, in my actions. Much less think that because of all these attempts at obedience that God, God's just going to let you into heaven? I mean, come on, right? But check this out, okay? Because here's what comes next. Don't check this out. Verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Are you following this? I mean, like, after this guy's outrageous statement, like, there are all these I've kept since, some of, since I've been a boy. Like, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. Okay? Teachers, remember this. When that kid is sitting in front of you, you just, like, can't even believe that they would have said or done something like that again. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. You know why? Because Jesus loves sinners. Jesus loved this young man because Jesus loves sinners and friends. That's such good news because G that means Jesus loves you and me too. I, I don't know how old this rich young man is. I, mean, I, I imagine he's kind of like 40. Maybe that's because I'm about 40, you know? <laughs> Taking a Spanish class in the high school this year, just an aside, and we had to partner up. And uh, my partner, we had, we had to describe each other. And my partner said that I have uh, my, the, the hair color of my hair, grease, gray, right? Like, oh, hi, really? And I'm looking at that, like, hold on, Sarah, I think I need a haircut, you know? <laughs> right? I don't know how many more years this young man had had in his life. I don't know how many more years I'm going to have in my life. If I live 41 years, how many more do I got? 40, 30, 20, 10 to make a difference? I don't know, right? But Jesus loved this young man. And the thing is, friends, he loves you and me so much. He loves us too much to let us hold on to our worthless idols, which he knows can ultimately only let us down and leave us, leave us empty. And that's why the next thing that Jesus says to this man is this. He says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Heart check right now. If Jesus said that to you, what would be your action? And he would say, I'd be tempted to walk away. Find a different church. There's got to be somebody out there that's going to tell me something else. Like, right? YouTube will show you what you want to hear. <laughs> and then more and more and more what you want to hear and what you want to hear. So you have no idea what's actually right here. Jesus reaching out to you in love because he doesn't want you to get hurt. So he's going to tell you the truth. He's telling this guy, to get to heaven, you've got to let go of your idols. They cannot save you. Only I can. And that's what Jesus is trying to show this rich young man. Because he loves him, Jesus has to reveal what's really on that young man's heart. The throne. The throne of his heart. Because right? he had the audacity to think that he was kind of like good enough in the sight of God, keeping the commandments. Well, what, what Jesus is doing is he's trying to help this man see like you, you, know, you haven't been good enough. In fact, you think, you dare to think, you've kept all these commandments. And you know what, buddy? You haven't even kept number one, numero uno. You shall have no other gods. And Jesus just revealed to this man 
But he had a false god sitting on the idol of his, of his heart. It was called money. He was worshiping at the idol of prosperity and worldly success, and he ended up exchanging the eternal for what is only temporary. And so he walked away. He walked away from the only one who truly can say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except, except through me. Again, in verse 22, it tells us, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So what happened? The, the man, he, he, he went to Jesus, he listened to Jesus, he heard what Jesus said, but it made him sad. And he chose to walk away because he thought, no, Jesus, that, that's not what I want to hear. That, that's just not for me. And so the young man's response to Jesus showed that he loved his idols more than he loved God. Friends, it's that easy to walk away from Jesus. You know, you can come to church, you can, you can listen to the sermon, you can, you can read the Bible, you can study all day, and that's good. But if you don't hear what God tells you to do and think, yeah, that's what I want to do, then that might just be because you've actually got an idol sitting on the throne of, of your heart that you love more than God. If you hear sermon after sermon, and you think to yourself, yeah, that sounds good, that's nice, you know, maybe for those people, or for that guy over there, for, for her. But, you know, that's just not something I'm going to do. I'm going to keep looking at porn. Nobody has to know. I don't really need to tithe. I'm not going to actually use my time to serve other people in love. You're like, I'm just like, I'm going to draw the line. Like, that might just be because you've actually got an idol sitting on the throne of your heart that's in control instead of your Savior who loves you. And so, friends, you can, you can kind of like win the game, so to speak. King of the hill. You can be on top of the world and still in the end lose it all. Whew. Right? But, hey, imagine for a moment that the story wasn't over. Imagine there's another chapter for this young man as he walks away. Imagine if, as the young man walks away, he, he thinks to himself and he realizes, what have I done? How can I walk away from Jesus? How can I, how can I walk away from my Savior? How, how can I walk away from the, the only one who is truly good? And who loves me with the most pure, unselfish, determined kind of love to the extent that he would be willing to sacrifice his sinless life and take everything he didn't deserve, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world, and die for me. How could I walk away from someone who would love me like that? What do you think his life would have looked like if he hadn't walked away? You know, who, who could he have blessed through joyfully giving in response to God's grace? How many people could he have helped to the glory of God? How many lives could he have impacted eternally if he, if he kicked off the throne of his heart all of his false gods and instead he laid those gods at the feet of Jesus in the service of the gospel for the good of the church? How much of an impact could he have had? And how much more joy if he had only realized that heaven, heaven was given to him already as a gift. Not because of his flawed attempts at obedience, but as a gift. Thanks to Jesus who did it all. And did it all perfectly. And through the gospel continues to say to all of us to this day, I forgive you. I love you. I'm preparing a place for you with me in heaven. Friends, how about you? Now, we, we all have different gifts, different 
abilities, different opportunities, different callings in life. Right? How can you use yours to the glory of God? To make an impact for the sake of the gospel, the kingdom. You know, money, success, business opportunities, influential connections, those things aren't, they're not bad. The blessings of God, but they just don't belong on the throne of your heart. They belong at the feet of Jesus in loving service of him who has earned the right to sit on the throne of your heart. So if you're, if you're maybe, if you're here today, if you're watching and you're, you're thinking to yourself just a little bit, like the Holy Spirit's working in your heart, and you're thinking, man, that's, you know, something, something's going to change. But, but, I, but I don't quite know where to start. But where do I start? Well, ask yourself this. Imagine, imagine this is you. Jesus is, is talking with you. You're running up to Jesus. You had some questions for Jesus. Jesus takes the time to talk to you, and you're having this conversation. Ask yourself, what might Jesus say that I should do with the blessings that he's given me to prove that these things aren't idols? What might Jesus ask me to do with the blessings that he's given to me throughout my life? Not because I'm trying to get, get to heaven by obeying his commands, but because he's forgiven my sins and promised me an eternal inheritance of riches in paradise. What might Jesus ask me to do to show others that it's not all about being king of the hill? What about showing the way to the one who wants to be the king of our hearts? Amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all our human understanding, guard our hearts through faith in Jesus Christ.